And then I started, I, I picked up the white paper, read the white paper, mm -hmm. became really fascinated. And I've spent probably the last three years accumulating a much larger position on Bitcoin. I think me buying Bitcoin today is at 28,000 is a safer risk adjusted bet investment strategy than it was in 2017. When people start using the product Bitcoin, they will then learn the difference between the old world and the new world. I spent three and a half million dollars on a Saturday afternoon. The day Celsius was breaking up, mm. I had to fund Node 40 for my 40% investment. Three and a half million dollars. He got it at 232, shifted it to stable coins, and was using the funds within seconds. So I really appreciate it and love it when we get more folks from entrepreneur, traditional finance base that just get it why Bitcoin digital assets are essentially going to be the future. And the reason for this is we need as many people as we possibly can to educate and um, be the voice of reason as I think fiat and economies around the world are starting to collapse. So with that in mind, uh, I got to say welcome, Gary Cardone, to the uh, channel for the first time. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. Yeah, man. I, I saw a couple of different interviews with you and I was like, oh, this guy, this guy gets it. This is going to make my job super easy. But uh, before we go on with the, with the questions, Gary, there's a little quick background of, of yourself. Uh, looks like you were the uh, VP of Natural Gas Clearinghouse, then you became president and CEO of Dynagy Europe, which was a Fortune 30 company. You've headed up a bunch of different companies like uh, real estate with Cardone Real Estate Holdings, uh, e-commerce with Global Risk Tech, as well as CEO and co-founder of Chargebacks 911 for uh, fraud mitigation, risk management, that type of stuff. And of course, now you're a Bitcoin digital asset advocate being a majority shareholder for Node40, which is accounting and crypto tax platform. So which is, I think, a pretty good company to be in since you've been investing in Bitcoin since 2016. Yep. And uh, I think this is, we're in the right place at the right time. So Gary, let's get into it. I've seen some of your interviews and they go super long. So I'm gonna try to condense this as best as I possibly can. Let's go over some of the basics. First of all, I'll ask these three questions. How'd you get into Bitcoin? The second one will be, well, why, why will Bitcoin be mass adopted? And, and give us just a little outlook for the future. So let's start with the first, the, the, the basic of basics. How did you get a Bitcoin, man? Because in 2016, I remember I got in 2017 and I thought it was a fraud. I didn't really see it. Uh, but what did you see that a lot of people didn't? Well, I clearly, thank you for having me first off. Uh, yes, I'm, really, I'm really enjoying uh, this industry. I, I see this as a, not as Bitcoin. I see this as an industry, a multi-trillion dollar industry that's being built. And I think if people look at it that way, it uh, opens the opportunity up for not only investing in some of these opportunities, but there's businesses that, that are going to be built around this type of uh, disruptive technology invention. I got into it, quite frankly, I'd spent from 2012 to 2016, we built CB911. That became the largest independent agnostic uh, disputes platform in the world, uh, a global business. Visa would become a big client, MasterCard, FIS, WorldPay, people like that, Nuve, PaySafe, uh, these, a lot of e-commerce uh, bank providers, right? Well, they're really vendors. Uh, but they made e-commerce work. And I, I tend to get really deep into markets. Um, I think with my commodity background, uh, he started laughing, but I, do, I go really deep into a market. That's good. Uh, yeah, because that's good. W w the, my training really was about understanding supply and demand. And uh, in order to understand supply and demand, you have to understand the entire value chain, who's making money and where it starts and where it stops. In looking at payments, the payment industry, by payments, I mean the credit card, debit card industry where people buy things from retailers and they use credit card transactions. Um, I was absolutely flabbergasted in the first few years about how much leakage, friction, uh, waste there is in the payment industry relative to the energy complex, which I came from. And my, my thought process was, hey, energy... You know, if electricity stops flowing to your home, uh, you guys are going to have a problem. If electricity mm -hmm. stops flowing to hospital, people die, right? 
we commoditized uh, 50 men across the planet, maybe a couple of women, but 50 people across the planet basically went into Western markets, United States, North, all of North America and Europe and transformed. That's what I was doing in England for 10 years, right. changing the regulations such that supply and demand could speak to each other without an oligopoly, a monopoly or a duopoly, the most dangerous of all three of those duopoly. Uh, do op th these constructs distort supply and demand so they don't speak to each other? And I was seeing so much friction in the internet, in the internet payments piece of the business. I was like, well, this is, if it's not going to be stopped in its tracks, it will always increase. Mm -hmm. And I could not understand why the card schemes weren't putting their foot down. All the regulatory processes that occurred over the last 10 years in payments created more friction, more damage to the consumer, not less. It has not worked. I do not see the payment rails working. And the reason is the payment rails were built in 1972. Right. Okay, 52 years old, never considered e-commerce. Mm -hmm. The World Wide Web was not built to be a payments platform. It was built for a communication event. And they never understood, look how smart these people are. And they missed the whole cojona. This is going to end up being a financial transfer mechanism because I think money is simply a method of communicating. They just didn't have the pieces into the, they never considered putting the payment piece into this because the truth is the World Wide Web helped all of finance. Right. It is the only industry that did not get damaged. <laughs> OK, Web 3.0 is going after the rest of the margin that was not so far attacked. And that's making a market efficient. And so you have a lot of opacity in uh, opacity is unclearness. It's not transparent. You can't go into Visa's P&L or their. Uh, public documents and say, how much do they make from fees, fines, chargeback? Then you start to realize, oh, you can't see it. Well, you can't see it because that's the reason it's continuing to exist because it's a profit center. Right. Okay. All this friction is a profit center for very many vendors, including chargebacks 91. I always told my partner, I'm like, we're lucky to have this bloody business. It's built mm -hmm. on a poor construct. So I started actually investing in gold and right. guns. I bought 600 guns on one afternoon because I could buy, you know, a bunch of ARs, put them in a storage facility. I got a monster price. I'm brand new. I've never even opened the thing. So don't, don't think I'm a, you know, warmonger or anything, but I just thought it was, I'll never be able to buy 600 AR-15s for 300 bucks a piece. Might as top, well of, top of the line, right? Uh, yeah. Well, I'll give them to my kids one day and they'll do something with them. Right, right, right. Uh, I bought about 300 times more gold than I did Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't very smart. Ah, but, the best but, exactly. I mean, so, and then I left it alone, Rob. I literally didn't even look at it for four years. Mm -hmm. And then I started getting more bored. I was trying to exit my business because I predicted that we would be here where mm -hmm. you don't have any capital flowing into businesses. Interest rates are up. Um, and I'm like, I don't want to be in a great business and not be able to exit it. That that's, so it was a very complicated exit. I have a thousand years of, uh, videos to do over poor governance and a family owned business, how to lose $200 million <laughs> and still make a bunch of money, but it was inefficient. Um, and then I started, I, I picked up the white paper, read the white paper, mm -hmm. became really fascinated. And I've spent probably the last three years accumulating a much larger position on Bitcoin. I think me buying Bitcoin today is at 28,000 is a safer risk adjusted bet investment strategy than it was in 2017. It, I think I bought my first thing was seven grand or eight grand, something like that. Uh, and, and, most certainly at 28 grand, I'll buy some after this uh, interview. But at today's price, I think it's uh, a better risk reward than it was when it was eight dollars. Yeah, I can see that. So that's why 
essentially while you're getting into it. And uh, Gary, I got to tell you, I can tell why your interviews go long because you have a wide breadth of information that you're willing to share. And I got to tell you, if you right now are, you're listening to the video and you're liking what you're hearing, check out Gary. He's got a lot of different uh, places you can find it. Right now, mostly it is on, it is on Twitter or X and you can find him over there. He's also doing a bunch of uh, Twitter spaces with people in, in the space. And it looks like you got a YouTube channel that you're going to start up at some point. Of course, there's also one for Node 40. So I will link that in the description so you can find Gary and you can continue on uh, and you can see how his journey is going and uh, what's happening. And then just to piggyback on what you said, Gary, when you said about, you know what, uh, this is going to crush, you know, this is a, an asset that does quite well. There was a great piece that put out by Charlie Baleo. And he takes a look at the asset class return since 2011. And we take a look at what you just talked about. I mean, as far as Bitcoin, US, the NASDAQ 100, convertible bonds, high yield bonds, cash, gold, US value, real estate investment trusts, and long duration treasuries. And if we did this cumulatively and take a look at it, I don't even, it's hard for me to contemplate this number, but 8,908,509% from 2011 to 23. And if we annualize that, it's 144%, which beats out everything. So I know, like when you talk about these things, I understand because I did the same thing. I invested into some other stuff that wasn't as well and didn't do as well. But moving forward, I think, again, we're in the right place at the right time. And that would lead me to the next question, which is this. And you can touch on this mostly already, but why will Bitcoin be mass adopted? I mean, we've had other things in the past that have done quite well, but what you just talked about as far as the business and the incompatibilities and the different rails from the finance sector in 1972 moving forward, why do you think Bitcoin will actually be mass adopted? Just to add on to what you said. Uh, well, I'm not sure it will be. All right. Funny enough. And I'm not even sure that it needs to be. I think, you know, you, to me, you would have to also say when. Uh, and what does mass adoption really mean? And I'm sorry that I go on so long, but I, I think that like, You're good. But, but the few points. No, I'm really talking about to the audience because yeah. I hate giving an answer without some background. Like, uh, I don't like many of the this new public platform, unless somebody comes up and says, look, I am extremely biased because I own X, you know, I own a lot of Bitcoin mm -hmm. and uh, I'm really deep in this space or versus a guy that's, Hey, I own $10 worth of Bitcoin. I'm going to be a pontificator and a leader. Like it does make a difference. Right. And I'm yeah. 65. And so I would not want anyone to go out and do what I do because they don't really know what my position is, right? My position, I, I've, I have extremely high risk tolerance. Um, it's what excites me. When I first met the Bitcoin community and they were pushing adoption from the under bank, mm -hmm. right? That's, hey, there's 3 billion under banked or non bank people. I think that's a flawed mechanism to get adoption. I think the adoption will come from people like me it will first start with business to business because it is those businesses that really are sensitive to why am I paying these fees to a bank to, to roll out half a million dollars to a vendor that I pay every month. And I've got to make the same phone call. It's painful. It's time consuming. There's no real security behind it. Uh, I bought node 40. If when people start using the product, Bitcoin, they will then learn the difference between the old world and the new world. I spent three and a half million dollars on a Saturday afternoon. The day Celsius was breaking up, mm. I had to fund Node 40 for my 40 percent investment from five institutions at two thirty in, in the afternoon. I sent Perry Wooden three and a half million dollars. He got it at two thirty two. Shifted it to stable coins and was using the funds within seconds, okay? From five banks, it took me 12 minutes, $12 to transfer three and a half million dollars. Imagine if I was trying to do that on a Monday, assuming the bank was open, never gonna happen on a Saturday, not a chance, right? Um, it was the most efficient transaction I've ever done with another human bank, okay? I've done gold transactions physically with people, literally paid for services. Perry saw me do that once. Uh, but I did this one 
800 miles away. He's in New York. I'm in Florida Saturday afternoon and Galaxy and Celsius were both completely imploding. I had zero problems. I, it, when you'd use it, uh, until someone uses it and really understands, whoa, no secretaries, no CFO, no treasury department, it was lightning fast. And it settled instantly, right? And there was no recourse for me whatsoever. So I like those trades. I think that's a big boy trade. It reduces friction. And I think what Michael Saylor has been really helping the industry do with this FASB rule, dude, this is a monster change. Okay, you're going to see now companies going, I like the way to be able to move money. And that to me is the next step that corporates start putting this on their balance sheet. They're then going to go, HR is going to walk in and go, you know, we have 30% of our employees that would like to get some part of that payment in Bitcoin. Well, it's on their balance sheet now. Boom, boom. Okay, now it becomes, look, it's a slippery slope to get disruption to move into mainstream. I've spent decades doing this where you go into big markets and it takes a lot of pushing and shoving and, you know, carousing and promoting. And like, all you have to do, though, is a few little leaks start drop and then people go, okay, I'm going to increase my margin by taking that strategy over here. And I think that's what you're seeing. I mean, look at micro strategy stock price. Right. Okay. Now, if you go back on your chart, I actually remove everything before 2018. I, I, I pretend like Bitcoin did not exist before 2018. The return is 570% mm-hmm. from 2018. Only is uh, junior to Tesla. Right. Tesla, I think, has been since 2016. has been one of those uh, major, uh, major, major movers in the space. Yeah. Um, so it, it, that, that's kind of that's kind of how it came into the space. I think the, the uh, adoption. We don't need a billion people. Right. I, I'm, I'm actually concerned about Bitcoin that it doesn't have enough liquidity. The, some of the maxi people don't like me right now because <laughs> I, I, I just am very realistic about how long this change takes. Well, you know, just to, just to piggyback on what you say, uh, I got to agree here on, the, on this one part, because if you're talking about 8 billion people using Bitcoin, that's impossible. And if we just, it's very simple. Back in the day, you remember this back in the day. I mean, if we take a look at the average transaction fee, of Bitcoin, when does it go up, which it becomes unusable, quite honestly. I mean, not for like when, okay, Gary, when you said that you can move millions of dollars, you're not, a, you're not really caring about $50, $45. But for the average Joe or the person out there who is trying to become uh, banked, who is unbanked, it's very difficult, especially when you start to see mass people using it. And it's not even that much. Right now, I think we're seeing 5% of the people. So in 2017, 2018, you're looking at a $50 transaction. You can't buy things like that if you're using uh, Bitcoin. Of course, we come over here in the 20s. Wait, wait, so, so what does this chart show? This shows the average dollar transaction of Bitcoin? Yes, the Bitcoin average transaction fee. So, Not right so that, this is interesting. So the average credit card transaction is $106.38. And I think right. it's going to crash, okay? You're going to see micro transactions all over the place. Yeah, well, this is well, Gary. This is just the fee to actually move it. it doesn't matter. You oh, know, the fee. This isn't the average ticket. Sorry. This yeah, is this the is the fee. average. Okay. Sorry. This, this is the fee. So that's when we talk about. Like you're right. It's impossible to say uh, because moving forward, like who's going to use these fees? So I think, like, it is a good people. You, me, and you both read the white paper, which I think everybody should read the white paper, right? And it says very specifically right there, it's a peer-to-peer transaction method. Now, when we start to go into like this is a store of value and this is great. Even McCormick from what Bitcoin did, who was a huge Bitcoin maximalist, said, look, he goes, in all honesty, if you're looking at a third world country and they're using it, it's not a really great store of value, especially if you're going down 30, 40% in a month. Can you imagine? He said, in all honesty, even stable coins are much better. So on that, what you said, yeah, it is very true. But moving forward, you know, and I think you've talked about this on other, other shows, fiat, fiat currency inflating away and things like that. If we're going to start, this is the M2 money supply. If we're going to keep doing this, which is what America is great at, we turn the money printers on, M2 money supply goes up, 
then we see inflation. And of course, I don't know about the average person out there, but I know like for the average home cost has gone up two, three, sometimes four X, depending on the market. I can guarantee people's wages haven't gone up that much, but the inflation rate has. So it's a good thing to think about. And Gary, you know, on this one, I think you're right. But that would lead us to the last one, which but, is the- but, but, but back to adoption. I think the real underbanked adoption, the stuff in South Africa, see this, this is, um, I actually think having all these other solutions, assuming they're not criminal. Right. I don't have a problem with any of these other solutions. My theory is, and I don't buy, invest in them. I don't even own any Ethereum anymore. It scared me so much. I'm like, hey, I, I don't believe it's decentralized. I mean, I might as well just go back to the bank. I know these bank people. I can't call Vitalik and go, hey, bro, I need some margin. I need, a mar I need a few days of margin here. I can call my bank and tell them that because I've got a bunch of assets with them. But, um, you know, when Bitcoin's at a half a million dollars, I can't do the math here. But, you know, if you divide the number of Satoshis, yeah. once Satoshis get to be a penny, half a penny, I think then you have a currency that people aren't even going to talk about Bitcoin. They're going to talk about Satoshis. Yeah. The price needs to move up for the Joe consumer to come in. That's why I think guys like you and me, I wouldn't mind paying the $50 fee to, to move three and a half million dollars. Cause that's the right way to do it. That's where you'll get scale. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause you're going to be moving big chunks of money. People are going to see that it works. And then it's, Oh, Hey, a Christmas present. I'm mm -hmm. going to send a thousand dollars to my sister instead of going shopping. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to send her a 10th of a Bitcoin. Uh, right. So I, I, that's where I see that, that big exchange happens. It's never been the case where 10 million people start trading potatoes with each other. There's always a distributor in between each other. Mm -hmm. Right. It, right. It just it's the way markets work. So. Yeah, you're right. And then uh, just to piggyback to say that, you know, like transactions, I know people are screaming at the screen right now and going, what about lightning? The lightning network is going to drive everything down. Now it goes back to what we were talking about adoption. If they can get Lightning Network and go in there and it actually, you know, really pushes in, then sure, I can see what, where it's going. I'm just saying that right now, me and Gary on the same page, we're kind of on a little bit of an unusable type of product, unless you have no problems with doing $50, $60 transaction fees for moving X amount of dollars. All right. So that would, Gary, that'll lead us to the last, which we actually are pretty much touch on, which is the outlook for the future. And this could be anything you want to. We could talk about short-term future, long-term future. I think we all know, and you said this in an interview, over 7,000 years, all fiat currency has uh, gone to zero. But and we know that's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. But what do we look at for like uh, outlook for the future? Let's go short-term. Because right now we're looking at uh, October 5th, 2023. How about 2024, 2025, 2026? as far as the uh, Bitcoin and digital asset market. And this could be anything you want to want to talk about. Sure. I think if you're holding Bitcoin, um, and I am, mm -hmm. I think we have 14 to 18 months. And if Bitcoin does not do what, let, let's face it, we have all been really early here. Okay? <laughs> timing has been wrong. Let's admit it. The timing's yeah. wrong. The market's like, Everyone in Bitcoin has underestimated how long this takes. I'm not being mean to you. It's just a big old market. Okay. That's it's the, uh, it's awesome. You know, I go fishing in the ocean, the entire Pacific, like where am I going to plant my bait? Right? Like who knows? Uh, so I think we get an ETF in 2020. I thought we'd get one this year, but clearly our government is just being a dick. Excuse my language, but like this is now just, we're going to delay because we, we, we want to irritate you. Yeah. Uh, it is a no brainer. This is happening. And if the United States wants to stay out of this, they are going to lose one of the greatest opportunities in, in mankind. The truth is they're only 12% of the market. So they don't even have a say in it period. Mm -hmm. End of story. It's really fascinating. It's the first time America in a hundred years has not been in control of a monster industry. That's a big deal. Okay. You can't sit there and go, wow, in 100 years, this is the first industry that the United States has not been able to like completely manage, 
control the process. They control all the inputs and outputs of energy in Europe today. Mm -hmm. All of them. Okay. Like think with that, that's heavy. They control all the military that's in Europe today too. And thus all the money. Um, so I think next year is going to be really fascinating. Uh, I hope Binance doesn't blow their, you know, face off. And then we have another, you know, vomit moment on Bitcoin. But that truly will be if it happens. And I hope it happens. If it's going to happen, let's get it over. Yeah, rip the bandaid off. Uh, I've been actually surprised. And I've got some really interesting friends. Big commodity traders are like, hey, this price should be at 800 bucks right now with all the, sh the carnage that's occurred in this bloody industry. It's a total circus. It's Enron, WorldCom, uh, Mad Madox, or whatever his name was, <laughs> plus a total circus, right? On mm -hmm. YouTube, Twitter spaces, and LinkedIn all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it it's not becoming a big corporate. They don't want to do this, right? Like nobody's ever heard of me until the last two years because I dealt with big carpets and they don't want a bunch of vocal mouthing of what happens in their marketplaces. I, th I think the slippery slope that we got on, we are digitizing planet Earth. I think. And you're not going to digitize part of it. We're going to digitize all of it. it is not, you're not going to have part of it on a horse and buggy. And then part of it with Tesla's automated, nobody's even driving the bloody car. Like if automated cars get on the roads, guess what? You're going to take humans off the road. You can't have robots and humans driving around. Right? There's two different variables. I mean, you're going to have wrecks all the time. It will be the humans. Um, so I just see this moment where I think we're, we have an, I've never seen a window like this where Joe domestic can either invest in Bitcoin if he's got $1 mm -hmm. and front run the man. This is so clear. They're all coming. There's $800 trillion sitting in uh, asset classes. Right. And a new asset class has been born. The first mm -hmm. asset class in 30 years has been born and basically rubber stamped and anointed by Secretary Gary Gensler, mm -hmm. uh, the, the SEC chairman, saying this is a sustainable asset class. Larry Fink said it is a sustainable asset class. McKinsey and every other top accounting firm, a sustainable asset class. And all the family offices have yet to participate. Family office participation in the ultra wealthy is less than 1% allocation of Bitcoin. Hmm. And you got BlackRock writing a report saying the proper allocation should be 83%. I mean, that blows everyone's mind. Have you seen that? Yes. And uh, well, here's the thing. Here. So yeah, per perfect, perfect segue. So it blows everybody's mind now. But it also blew everybody's mind because I remember I, was, I talked to Simon Dixon not too long ago and he talked about how it blew his mind when Bitcoin hit $100 when he was investing in 2 or $3. And then, of course, people were like, it'll never get to 1000 It'll never get to 20000 It's the same narrative coming over and over again. But like you said, I think if we're going to front run anything, I think this is the time and we are super duper early. The technology has to catch up. So, But, but, but see, see we, we need to remember to remind it, hey, we are still early. And that means you could get into a position in Bitcoin and appear to be underwater. Okay. You're okay. early. Okay. Like everyone's been early. I own $50,000 Bitcoin. I own $40,000 Bitcoin. I own 20,000. Actually, I don't own any of that because what I actually did was because I bought node 40 software. That's how mm -hmm. I met these guys. I took a monster tax loss. Sold all, moved all my Bitcoin to buy a Node 40 on that afternoon, took yeah. a million dollar loss. Mm -hmm. Okay, then reloaded all that Bitcoin. I replaced all that Bitcoin in the last four months at twenty thousand uh, dollar discount to where I was. See, this is when it gets really smart because you have another asset you can move around, especially when it's volatile. Like mm -hmm. having a volatile asset is not necessarily bad. I would take 570% return 
for five years. If you told me the price was going to do this every day, <laughs> like nobody sells their 401k, man, when the market goes down 20%, they don't even look at it. So if it's a store of value, just stick it in the 401k, hold it for four or five years and keep studying. Right. And just keep letting that money work. Uh, look, it's the only asset in the world that can't be printed, made up, no matter what the price is. A trillion dollars, you can't go produce more Bitcoin. At a hundred dollars, every drop of oil will come into this market. Oil prices in the, in the, in the world will never, ever exceed a hundred dollars. Not for long periods of time. Um, gold can only go up so much. Right. In my opinion. I mean, none of these things can't be produced. So I just look at it as a, you know, gosh, I think I, I, I I'm going to allocate some piece of this. Yeah. Um, and if I'm wrong, okay, I'm wrong. But what if I'm right? Shoot. What if we're all right? So, Gary, you said a lot in a short amount of time. So we talked about everything as far as mass adoption, what things are going to happen. And I like your opinion of uh, moving forward into the next year. And of course, we're super early and we'll see what happens. So everybody, if you like what you hear, there's a great place to find Gary. There is a link in the description. Here is his link tree. Uh, mostly you can find him on uh, Twitter. And of course, we'll help him get his uh, YouTube channel up and running. And we'll uh, go from there. So we can actually start put, spitting out some, some videos. Gary. Thanks so much for stopping by, man. Any last words of wisdom for the investor, even though the last one you said was pretty good. You don't look at your 401k, you don't look at other things, why are you looking at here? But any last words of wisdom? Dollar cost average. <laughs> Do good. not Perfect. try to pick the bottoms, guys. You're not a professional. Even the pros can't do it. Don't pick the bottoms. Don't try to pick the tops. Dollar cost average and you'll be just fine. And, and, and manage your position. You, know, you don't have to like, go all in, sell your house, sell your car. And like, that's not necessary. It's not even smart. So just do well and, and read. Uh, anybody that reads, I mean, you're going to be much better equipped if you're investing in yourself. And that's probably the best investment anyone can make. Got to agree there. Readers are leaders. So everybody, if you like today's video, thumbs up, subscribe with the good stuff. You can find Gary. Gary, again, thanks for stopping by. And of course, we'll see you guys in the next one. Thanks, man. Great seeing you, huh?